I can see the uh, number of participants creeping up. So for those of us who have joined in any interest of time, I will kick everything off. So hello and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. Um, and I will pay, pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Um, my name is Ruby Griffin and I'm the Industry Networks and Mercer Learning Leader for the Pacific. Um, for many years, Mercer Learning has supported our clients to develop their HR leadership capabilities with our own methodologies and those of our strategic partners. And I'm delighted to be joined by some of those clients and one of our partners today to discuss the race to reskill and how organizations can accelerate their workforce capabilities. So with that, let me just introduce our panel. So um, firstly, Kim Backrich, um, Director of People and Partnerships from Victoria University. Uh, Kathy Tompkins, the Director of Incremental Leaps, um, one of our Mercer Learning Partners. Um, Darren Pierce, Head of Talent and Employee Communications for Australia and New Zealand from the Kraft Heinz Company. And finally, Angela Tosato, Group Head of Human Resources from SG Fleet. So thank you so much for our panelists for joining us today. Um, a quick bit of housekeeping as well for everyone. Um, everybody is on mute as you've dialed in, um, but we will be using the Q&A functionality. So please post your questions for the panel in the box there uh, and we'll do our best to get around to them and answer them live during the Q&A at the uh, section at the end of our conversation today. Um, and then also please make any comments or observations using the chat functionality as well. Um, with over hundred people or so on the call, we probably won't be using the raise hand function um, today. So, with that, um, before we get started, I'll share my screen a moment um, just to go through some of the sort of key themes on the topic that um, our global talent trends research um, has demonstrated, and just, just to demonstrate why the future of work is so pertinent at the moment. So, um, without further ado, first off, The way, as our partners at the World Economic Forum have highlighted, the world is changing, the world is facing a reskilling emergency with more than one billion jobs, almost one third of all jobs worldwide, likely to be transformed by technology in the next decade or so. At the end of 2019, Google Health announced that uh, their AI system was just as good, if not better, than human radiologists at detecting breast cancer. The implications for radiologists, selection requirements on the job clinical training, et cetera, and for those in adjacent jobs, such as radiology technicians, are uncertain. And even before the pandemic accelerated some of these trends, industry dislocation and transformation were just around the corner in every sector of our life. 41% of respondents to our global talent trends stated that investing in future learning and workforce reskilling would make the most sizable difference to their business performance. The question is, is uh, are we transforming our skills as fast as our business models? So a quick question, what percentage of the workforce do executives in Australia believe can adapt to the new world of work? Well, well those three answers, four answers, D, 40%. But encouragingly, 78% of employees in Australia say they are ready to reskill. So, where is reskilling on HR's priority list? HR is focused on many things, but measuring skills gaps against business objectives and investing in future learning are number two and number five on the list of priorities. We need to think differently about how we forecast future needs and where those skills are retained. With that in mind, 65% of Australian companies um, plan to increase their build strategy, 51% plan to increase borrowing of talent, and 80% of executives say that their contingent workforce will increase in the near term. And the old approach to forecasting skills and strategic workforce planning was a rather sequential process. Workforce strategy and planning was often independent of business strategy and technology roadmaps. Leadership and the chief technology officer would define and design technology solutions independently. HR would then manage workforce adjustments as needed. It was a reactive approach to technical retraining, reskilling and rebalancing of the workforce as technology was introduced. Today's approach is much more interrelated Workforce strategies integrated with business and technology strategy development, leadership, CTO and HR define and design cohesive technology and workforce solutions. There's then continuous and multi-dimensional training and development, building readiness for the new world of work and associated technologies. 
But how are people um, embarking on reskilling? We asked both employees and employers what the top five skills are of today and tomorrow. And you can see here that employees thought innovation, advanced interpersonal skills and customer experience skills are in demand now in the future. Whereas HR had a slightly different list of what's needed now versus what's needed in the future, with much more of a focus on agile transformation, data science, data visualization. Given these priorities, it's also surprising to then see the spread in the reskilling budget globally. We found that China's really leading the charge here, but Australia at around 1,250 US dollars per head is just ahead of the global average of 1,200 US dollars. But what's been effective in upskilling the workforce according to our survey? Well, secondments or placements outside of the company with suppliers or partners to learn skills and bring them back into the business, learning from colleagues in peer-to-peer -peer networks and formalized reskilling programs with, um, popular at over half of the organizations we spoke to. But when it comes to the barriers, HR's top barriers to reskilling were that they were concerned that talent would leave uh, once the investment was made and obviously the cost implications. But an additional barrier is there's a gap in the understanding what skills are needed and which people have those skills in their organization. So is the workforce ready for reskilling? What gets in the way of individuals learning was another question we asked. And the number one response was not enough time to undertake training. Number three was that my organization does not recognize or reward this type of learning. And number five was that there was no opportunity to use these newly acquired skills. So how do we incentivize for reskilling and transformation? Today, reskilling is very much part of the new work, the work deal for employees. And when asked what would help them thrive, the, the opportunity to learn new skills and technologies was number one. People are recognizing and wanting to be reskilled now because employees know that they're at risk of being displaced if they haven't adapted or retrained as fast as their business is transforming. Of those employees who are excited by the prospect of job reskilling, we found they were more likely to have a manager that has their back and operate in a climate of trust, were more likely to say, my company understands my unique skills and interests, and more likely to be able to say no to unreasonable work requests. And finally, we heard about the need for new and innovative rewards and recognition programs that support the reskilling effort with organizations considering options such as rethinking pay for performance by shifting to pay for skills models and by ensuring opportunities to acquire new skills then equate to new responsibilities. So what's the focus now as a result of the pandemic? Well, it's obviously accelerated the future of work as one of my colleagues recently said, the future of work is now, the future is now. It's increased the need to work from home, but to remain productive and maintain work-life balance. It's meant acquiring new digital skills and required people to develop stronger interpersonal skills, build adaptability and agility to overcome the challenges of working in this way, and to learn better ways to collaborate more effectively. The pandemic has brought leaders to the fore as they are increasingly required to be more present, connected and empathetic. And finally, as Mercer Learning knows well, there's been a significant acceleration in the pivot away from more traditional chalk and talk classroom based learning to virtual live online workshops and self directed e learning on platforms like LearnFlix, edX, or LinkedIn Learning. So, some of these meta trends as a backdrop for our discussion, I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and go straight into the QA. Um, so, I think to, to kick us off, I'll, I'll come to you, um, Kathy. Um, the first question, you work with a variety of different organizations. Um, what differences are you noticing in how they're approaching learning now compared to last year? Yeah, so I guess I was really surprised with how quickly organizations were able to pivot to the virtual classroom environment. Um, many organizations have actually taken the opportunity during the lockdowns to um, offer development to their staff, both to the employees and also to the leaders. Um, and I think the main difference there is that rather than full day classroom based programs, organisations are really opting for a more modularised approach. So having maybe three or four two hour sessions 
um, which actually quite frankly allows um, the employees opportunity to really apply their learning in the interim between sessions. Um, and there was a trend towards this even before COVID, but I think um, that digital capability increase that we saw so rapidly, particularly at the beginning, um, has made it really possible for participants to get involved and, and for facilitators to design classroom-based experiences in a virtual classroom um, that are really engaging and um, that people can get involved with and learn from. So, um, you know, I, I think it was a trend that was moving in that direction anyway, but we've seen an absolute acceleration because of what's happened this year. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I suppose a follow up to that, which I'll then open up to the panel after you, Cathy. So, you know, which skills have organisations been focusing on for their employees and leaders? What's been yeah. the in demand? Yeah, so I think there's three groups that I've seen demand come through for. The first is leaders. Um, leaders have had to deal with so much change and they're also, um, they don't have that access to the face-to-face -face so much with their employees at the moment. So they've really had to learn how to connect intentionally and really focus in on those interpersonal skills, developing, developing empathy, and also um, really focusing in on making those connections and understanding what their employees are needing. Um, employees is the second group and I've seen a lot of increase in self-management type of programs there. So even time management, dealing with difficult customer conversations as a lot of our, our customers are having to have those difficult conversations with their customers um, and even change agility. And I guess the third group that I've seen a real uptick in is um, the HR community. So I've seen the need for HR to be upskilled in facilitation virtually in change agility and also in considering um, what the impact of this is going to have on their culture. So I've seen uh, probably those three areas, there's been a lot of increased demand. Yeah. Kim, would you agree? What, what's it like for, for you's perspective? Yeah, thanks, Rupert. Um, I've seen two key standout areas around, the first around safety, uh, wellbeing and self-care, and the second around digital literacy. So uh, our first priority was to um, have people upskill uh, safely move off campus to the working from home environment and then the practical things like how to set up their home office, uh, how to use digital technology to connect, so similar to what Cathy was saying, and how to look after themselves, you know, how to make sure that they take the time out in their work day to take some breaks to, you know, do their homeschooling or whatever it is that came their way. And in that third one uh, was also uh, cyber security. So we saw a, a rise in the need to protect documents and uh, protect ourselves from uh, potential attacks of cyber. Um, the second area around the learning new technologies and teaching methods was something that was prevalent in our academic workspace in particular. Uh, you know, learning how to uh, deliver programs online where they traditionally done face-to-face -face delivery and looking at activity-based learning and how to use breakout rooms and that posed some challenges for them. Absolutely. Um, Angela? How about SG Fleet's perspective? Um, certainly for us, uh, change leadership's been um, a, big, a big focus. I think, um, you know, 12 months ago, change leadership was something that, that um, was important at particular times of the year or for particular projects, but now it's become, uh, it's become mainstream. People need to tap into that skill every day. Um, and so we've really needed to focus on, on that change leadership piece too. Also, I think um, in starting to look at uh, skills and, and skills gap analysis, um, that need for uh, upskilling coaching skills and managers, um, they've had to deal with certainly a, a personal care element for their teams that has been much easier for them to manage before when they've been face-to-face. -face. So um, certainly those two areas have been um, so the change leadership probably predated pre COVID in terms of the need, but um, and coming into COVID, it, it's kind of uh, put much more of a focus on that. So that's been that's been probably the greatest um, focus in the last six to nine months for us. Thanks, and Darren. How about you? What's what's your perspective? Yeah, so for us, Rupert, for the last 12 months at Craft Times, we've kept it quite simple, focusing on, you know, how teaching our employees how to lead, um, how to collaborate, how to solve complex problems. I think, you know, the race to reskill that we're talking about today, it, it starts with leaders themselves. You know, strong leaders, they build strong teams, and this is where you'll find where most of the employees will learn the most from, from a quick way. So if you think about the, the employees, so the, the, the adult learning, you know, approach 70, 20, 10, a really effective leader can drive 70% really well. So for us, like what we're doing, 
doing is around actually teaching our leaders to have really difficult conversations that are quite pointed. They're kind with kind intent, and you know they're coming from you know. Uh, I guess I'd say they're candid as well. Uh, so with that, you know, you're, you're having these conversations where employees are walking away, they're clear with what the job, uh, job opportunities are, they're understanding sort of how they can let their job learning stick more. And then the second part, that's actually, you know, getting our leaders to understand how to select high performing talent. You'd be surprised how many leaders have you no know, interviewing for the first time and bringing all these preconceived biases into the recruitment process. It's, and it's, it's slightly terrifying. And for us, we're using this opportunity to, you know, recalibrate, you know, what, how to select talent, you know, what are these biases, you know, what do, you know, top talent look for when working for strong leaders and, you know, when do you sort of take a bet on an individual or when do you take a select, you know, a safe option where it's selecting talent so for us it's been big on recalibrating layers with difficult conversations and how to select their top talent okay thanks Sarah. that's interesting Sarah. and i think you know yeah i mean just to stick with it, it kind of leads to our next question you know, how do we assess current workforce skills against the skills needed for the future and you know given the pace and dynamic nature of change how are organizations reskilling where future roles might not even be clearly defined yet yeah, look, I think for us, like it's it's quite an interesting point because many companies are at different stages of their recovery. Some are, you know, at the end of it, some are still learning from it. And like what I'm really passionate about is developing versatile talent. And what what the way I sort of just define that is around people who have this ability to be mobile across the business and they've got a core fundamental set of skills that they can sort of transfer from department to department. I think a great way that I'm sort of seeing this right now play out in the market, sort of tech functions in, in big corporates where you know, traditional sort of tech roles, you've got your business relationship managers who sort of talk directly to the business around their tech issues. And you've got the back of house tech specialists who are who are your testers, your cyber specialists, your developers, your coders. And there's this big focus on having, you know, this tech professional that's emerging, emerge of the two, so the mismatch of the two. They can talk to the business, but also talk to the tech and applying that lens sort of to, to craft times. We've got a big focus on getting the core organizational capabilities right. So like our lens so far on this is looking at sort of the soft skills around building effective communication, effective influencing and driving better cross-functional collaboration. And then the hard skills around sort of, you know, a consistent way of solving complex problems and even building, you know, basic financial and commercial acumen. So, you know, your mm-hmm. people can understand sort of the outputs they're doing, you know, how does that link back to, you know, overall business outcomes and performance. Um, but I'd say underpinning that as well, you know, a quick win could be just to really, you know, you know, invest some money in a good sort of employee diagnostic tool like a HBDI or a business chemistry or, you know, a disc profile. We actually understand sort of how, what are your preferences of your employees? How do they think? What are they mm-hmm. like? And that can sort of be your, your I guess, your recalibrations then decide what does the future look like? Okay. Yeah. Angela, I'll ask the same question of you as well. I know SG Fleet have, have, had, have transformed their business and obviously the people are going to have to transform to meet now. So what's your perspective? Yeah, look, we've, um, I think as many industries have gone through uh, a fair bit of disruption. Um, you know, we, we've moved from the traditional fleet management model to really more of a technology solution um, business. And certainly COVID's had an impact on that in terms of people's mobility or their changing mobility needs. Mm. Um, when it comes to, to skills that perhaps might be or future roles that might not be clearly defined, what we've had some really good success in is, um, for example, if uh, data science or uh, innovation are those sort of what we feel is um, emerging skills need you know, now into the future that we've been pairing or partnering um, subject matter experts um, with deep business knowledge with those innovation teams or those data science teams so that we're, you know, a cross-skilling those um, subject matter experts in that data science piece, um, but also getting a a really good outcome for a a customer in terms of a a product that's ready for market. So um, it's it's not a a science to it necessarily, but we certainly have had um, really good success through through secondment and actually exposing uh, people to other parts of of the emerging, emerging skills in the business. So everyone's had to be obviously very reactive to, to COVID and so on um, and predicting the future of skills has brought this you know, much, much more forward in, in everyone's consciousness. But so it has that. So what are some of the future of work skills that you've identified as sort of being potentially quick wins? So some of the things obviously that we've had to do very quickly in a reaction, but what about sort of some of the other things that we think that some of our, uh, some of the people in the course today might be more interested in understanding that would be a, a low hanging fruit as it were in the skills reskilling 
Darren, I'll start with you again, if you don't mind. Yeah, look, look for me. Look, as an accountant by training, I'm quite passionate about data, literacy, and financial acumen, building that really well in the business. I think, uh, I think as as a as a talent head, I have, a, I have a key expectation that my employees are able to talk to a basic, you know, PNL of the company, understand the cost drivers of the company, you know, what impacts the PNL, what impacts the EBITDA, the year to date performance, instead of how does your role then impact the organisation indirectly or, or or directly. So a really easy way that you know that we've done that's fairly it's really cost effective. It's a partner with your internal finance team to build that training to the broader business around, you know, what are the commercials of the organization, you know, and from that, it's a real development challenge back to the finance teams because they need to, need to simplify the complex that is finance, but you're also you're teaching your employees like the basics of, you know, what, you know, what, what, what is the language of the business that is, that is finance. So that's something that's been really quick, you know, that we've been able to do and, you know, it's understanding people, you know, when you're spending a dollar, like what, what does that impact on the broader business? Um, and that's something that I think, you know, we have a long way to go, I think, you know, overall across across Australia, but building that data literacy, financial literacy, like, you know, once we get that right, I think that, that will start the, the, you know, the speed to reskilling. Mm. Kim, how about from your perspective? You already discussed how, you know, obviously academics have had to shift from classroom based to virtual. What are some of the other sort of low hanging fruit that you've able to identify? Yeah, low-hanging fruit, I think, um, are more around the practical skills that people have had to learn. So, you know, learning to manage your day-to-day, -day, learning uh, what parts of the day you're most productive in, you know, when your mood is lower and you might do uh, more routine work or when you might be, um, you know, hyper-vigilant but uh, a decreased mood and you might do uh, other types of work. And learning really to juggle. So learning to juggle um, the things that are important that, to get done with the things that are less important to get done. Uh, I guess one other main thing I've seen is uh, the problem solving. So along the lines of what Darren was saying earlier, we've had to deliver some uh, innovative processes, unprecedented times in very short time frame. So things like, you know, staff asking, uh, what leave provisions can I access? And us thinking outside the box as to what might be possible. So in the past, we would tend to plan, 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 get approval and then roll something out. I've seen a real shift to doing and then improving rather mm. than trying to get it 100% right in the first instance. Yeah, that's a great perspective. Thank you. Angela, what would you say? I would certainly um, agree with Kim's uh, problem solving piece. We, we've had teams that have had to really pivot and develop new processes really quickly and get to the root cause of a problem without really having necessarily all of the facts or all of the information. So that has been a bit of a silver lining in terms of people uh, being able to develop those skills really quickly. I guess the other part of that too is perhaps more about um, preparing for future work skills. We've had to look quite rapidly at what skills we already have in the business. Um, you know, I think we, we have an untapped, um, uh, you know, resource of, of skills that might not be deployed in the person's current role, but they exist and can be harnessed. So I think we've, we've really identified uh, a quick win it is certainly to to understand what we have already and how we can deploy that to, to the business's um, advantage, but also the individuals in terms of uh, that school utilisation. Great. So we did have a few pre-submitted questions and Kim, there's one that really sort of spoke to, to your experience here. So, so what are some examples of how education providers are shifting to support the demand of new skills? So what's what's for you doing? Yeah, I think the, um, the online delivery is the obvious one, which we've talked about already. Uh, we've seen a, a growth in demand for micro-credentialing, and I think Cathy touched on that earlier. So this is where training can be undertaken in you know, short bursts, just in time, um, depending on what people need, and particularly in the digital literacy space and the data literacy space. Uh, we have seen training emerging in new occupations, such as robotics, um, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity. Uh, we've seen partnering, I guess, stronger partnering with industry, to gain more insights into what might the future skills look like. And I've seen you know, more panel discussions, video interviews, advisory panels. Um, that's probably enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so in terms of, we've talked about leadership, we've talked about some of the skills that they've, that they've required and we might come back to that a bit later, but um, how do we convince leadership that the return on investment in future work skills is worth it? Darren, I'm sure you've got some tales to tell. 
Yeah, look, I think, look, I mean, my response would be somewhat short here because I think it varies from company to company, but I think what's worked for me, I think it's really mainly two things. It's a showing sort of how this development journey is going to link back to the organisational journey. So how do we get people out of ways on the bus and I guess secondly showing is the hard quantitative people metrics that you know your organization has and like for me you know as HR lead I've got some very hard quantitative metrics around turnover around employee engagement and especially around talent acquisition around time to hire costs at cost of agencies you know first year retention so for me like when I built out my business cases, I've worked very closely to my HR analytics team to show like by taking a build approach to, to capability, you know, I'm able to reduce TA costs. I'm able to sort of, you know, drive better first retention, drive better sort of, you know, um, you know, improving of turnover. Um, I've seen better shifts in engagement at 15 to 20 points in some development opportunities we've done this year. And you know, in addition to that, you know, I've got employees who, you know, who are feeling trusted that they can, you know, invest in come on the longer term journey of the business and and it's a great time to do it in this time of uncertainty that most companies and most employees are feeling so in summary it's you know linking it back to the overall journey and linking it back to some hard metrics which is sort of how you know most of our executives talk great kathy i mean from your perspective what what what, what gets people over the line well for me um leaders want to see results um so they want to see particular to be able to go back into their business and apply what they've learned. They don't want them just to have a, a theoretical learning experience. So I've seen that where um, programs are really focusing on how do you use this in your business and that's incorporated in the program, um, that that's really something that gets leaders over the line. And I think the second thing is um, certainly for a lot of the programs I work with, I start with the executive team and I work with the executive team and um, very quickly there's that um, demand to say, well, how do we get this out to our staff? Because we want to be able to have them apply it in the same way so you know an example might be with um, Kim's organization with Vic Uni we started with uh, we looked at whole brain thinking and HBDI with the senior executive team and then we moved to the senior leadership group and in fact um, COVID was breaking while we were starting to run some of those sessions with the senior leadership group and so we used some examples of well you know what that's whole brain think COVID and the university and so the groups came up with different um, scenarios so they they looked at the master's um, students they looked at international students through the lens of the um, the instrument that we were working with so just making it very applicable um, and, and to that that context um, for those people so they're walking out ready to apply what they've learned I see that being a really big um, need um, when we're talking with leaders about what they want out of the programs. Right. So part of the, the talent trends sort of highlighted about where people were wanting to engage with skills from an employee's perspective, um, a lot of it was around culture and trust. So how do we build that climate of trust um, and that sort of trust culture um, that encourages employees to want to learn and um, upskill? Kim, I'll come to you first if you don't mind. Thanks, Rupert. Uh, look, the thing that stands out for me is authentic leadership. And... I think the key here is storytelling. So leaders sharing their experiences uh, in order to build trusting relationships with their staff and genuinely showing some empathy. But it's also important that they actively listen to the needs of the people, that they take the time out to um, you know, ask their people how they're going and actually help them to address any concerns that they may have. Uh, the other thing um, is around understanding that people move through the change cycle differently. So, you know, if we think about shock, you know, denial, anger, exploring, acceptance, people need different things at different times and they can go backwards and forward through that. So at certain times they may need information or support or some direction or some encouragement. And it's about tapping into what that individual needs. So a couple of innovative things that we've been doing to build trust at the university is We've set up um, some podcasts and it's called The Chat Room and it's where senior leaders have conversations with each other or with staff and they talk about their challenges. Um, what are they experiencing during lockdown? You know, um, not finding time to exercise or working out how they can fit that in their day or juggling work and homeschooling and this has made them feel very real uh, because they're experiencing the same things that our employees are. Okay. Right, and Kathy. Again, what do you think in terms of building culture, um, environment, that sort of environment? What, where does it? It starts with leadership, right? 
Absolutely. And I, I'd agree with Kim. I think change leadership is really a very critical skill for leaders in organisations. But I also think leaders set the tone. So if they take their own development, um, their own opportunity to improve seriously, they set the tone for the employees. And they also um, create the space for the employees to lean into the programs that are available. So I actually think um, that standard that they set goes right throughout an organisation. So what's the right balance then between an individual's responsibility and the organization's responsibility in building future ready employees? So if we're talking about developing things like growth mindset or agility, um, you know, building resilience, where's the responsibility lie? Is it on the business to encourage people to do this or is it on the individual to identify that they need these skills? Angela, what's your experience? Look, I, I think, um... I think the business has both a responsibility and an interest in cultivating um, that growth mindset. And, and I, I think, although it's you know, nice to think that every employer will reach out for skills development, I think we're very reliant on the coaching skills of our um, people leaders to, to have those conversations and, and have a, a confident, meaningful um, career and skill development conversation. So I think whilst... Um, you know, it's nice to think that employers will take response, employees will take responsibility for it, and, and many, many will. Um, there'll be others that that aren't quite as self-aware and, and need that that um, that manager to to tease that out of them, actually um, harness their potential. So you know, culture starts with leadership and has to have good management to to see it through down the line, right? Okay. Um, again, you know. Kathy, and I'll come back to the rest of the group as well, but Kathy, is there anything else that you'd add to that in terms of the balance? Yeah, look, I'd, I'd absolutely agree with Angela around the coaching capability. I've certainly seen lots of leaders who perhaps haven't considered the value of coaching, recognising um, that actually they need to shift the way that they interact with their, their people and ask more questions and do less telling. Um, so that'd be the first thing. But I think from an organisational perspective, I think the organisation can help in two ways. They can select the right programs that are going to really, you know, hit the spot. And I think the second thing they can do is they can consider diverse delivery channels because that both plays into the learning styles of individuals but it also um, allows people to access the learning regardless of the available time they have and I think if the organisation does both of those things um, then it's up to the employees to really lean in and take advantage of the opportunities. Um, Rupert if I could build on that too yeah. I think making it part of an expectation of a, of a line manager too I think we focus very much on on commercial outcomes and, and not necessarily some of these softer things that drive those commercial outcomes. Yeah. So making it, you know, measurable and and, um, and and rewarding as such. And it's interesting, Angela, because I think um, a lot of organisations are focusing on the softer skills now. Um, and I think soft skills is actually a misnomer for what they are. They're actually highly critical skills. Um, but I think, you know, COVID's given uh, organisations the opportunity to really look at that and perhaps spend a bit more time developing those skills in their employees. Yeah, definitely. And their leaders particularly. Yeah. Darren, would you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, the soft skills piece is something that we're making a big investment on. I think, you know, it's this ability to sort of, you know, um, you know, break down a silos, you know, um, you know, cross-function collaborate. You're all working towards the common goal. Um, it's it's more about building this mindset of we rather than me. Um, and, you know, getting that soft skills piece, it, 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 it's just really critical um, in this day and age. And also having leaders who will encourage that as well. It's more about spending more time on, you know, the how rather than the what. I think, you know, that's sort of how you're going to see people sort of, you know, really progress well in the workplace, see those people move into leadership positions because they're going to encourage those really, you know, critical behaviours uh, around the soft skills and the how. Uh, it's almost, I call it like removing the brilliant jerk, um, you know, within within organisations. I think that's something, you know, a shift we're going to start seeing, um, you know, as one of us, many of us start to return back into the workplace, you know, whenever we get to. Kim, anything to add? Have you encountered any resistance from employees, for example, to undertake training and courses and so on? Look, sometimes um, we, we do get some resistance. Uh, you know, training and development is extremely important. And as a manager, you want all of your staff to engage in this. But, you know, sometimes for one reason or another, they don't have time or they have other responsibilities and they don't. And I guess the only thing I'd add to uh, everything that's been said so far is that I think it's critically important that people drive their own career. So don't, don't be a passenger, you know, take charge and seek out opportunities. Often there's opportunities that are right in front of you, like shadowing someone or, um, 
you know, being part of a meeting, uh, a senior meeting that you might not have access to ordinarily. So they're there, you just need to ask. And leaders are quite willing to take people along. Absolutely. I think um, I'll add in as well on this one, um, to Kathy, to your, your point about making sure that what's on offer is, is right, you know, it's a right fit and is enticing for everybody. Um, there's a number of platforms and programs out there and some are, there's just too much choice i find so some of the sort of the, the self-directed e-learning type ones they're uncurated you could learn everything from you know how to be a psychic if you wanted to it's not really that narrowly focused whereas the more curated platforms are probably the ones that, that, that i'd certainly recommend um so um we're currently sort of just past the halfway point and um I'll just remind everyone that there's plenty of opportunity to add questions into the Q&A box down the bottom. So click on that and submit your question there. Um, so to sort of move us into that sort of live Q&A, again, I'll just sort of kick something off for the whole panel. Um, it'd be great to hear from each of your organisations, you know, what are some of the innovative approaches that your organisations have adopted so far? So we've touched on some of this, but um, Kim, if I start with you, what are some of the really sort of innovative things that you've done? I am really amazed at the amount of innovation that can come out of a COVID environment. It, it's incredible. Um, one of the standout innovations I've seen is a program that's called the VU 11s And it's a group of staff that got together and set up an online program. It's run daily. It's 15 minutes, so it's short and sharp. It's uh, aimed at internal staff. We have internal people coming along and presenting and we have external guests that are brought in uh, at times. It's driven by the people based on their needs. And it's really focusing on health, well-being, safety, and developing the knowledge and skills around mindfulness, healthy eating, you know, different exercise programs. Um, uh, and, and I guess really anything else that employee asks for. Hey. Angela? Um, I think a couple of things that we've we've you know, had and planner of implemented and, and perhaps it's come out of COVID is, is different ways to recognise people. We found that when people were working remotely, and this is perhaps not so much linked to skills, but recognising someone as a leader is a skill. Um, so we we innovated by by creating a shout out video every month that managers contribute to that we post on the internet and actually you know there's a way to to recognise um, that is virtual rather than uh, necessarily. Um, uh, face to face, and I think our, our people have been really innovative in terms of how they've uh, been able to continue collaborating by you know, embracing technology and, and self learning in that regard, and, and setting up um, you know teams for collaboration and so on that we would never have seen pre COVID. So it is somewhat of a of a silver lining, and I think it's really for me really highlighted how important it is to tap into people's different ways of hearing and learning and understanding, and I think. Um, you know, needing to do that virtually is really, um, you know, it's a real laser focus. Darren. Yeah, look, for us we're, uh, at Craft Times, it was an interesting time for us as a business because in December last year, we became Australia, New Zealand, Korea, and Japan. So one sort of big business unit. And with the border restrictions in place, it was very tough for us as a business to really sort of get to know, you know, the, the, the employees that made up the different parts of our business. So one of the things we implemented very early on um, in the year was um, an initiative called Human Hour, where people can uh, sign up for one hour slots. And you had one rule, you couldn't talk about work you had to get to know people um, across the company. And you had the, you know, it was around people sharing photos, the most memorable photos, the most memorable trips. It was about getting to, you know, building that human connection again. And you know, this was at the start of when everyone went back into lockdown, especially when New Zealand went to stage four sooner than what Australia did and what Victoria did. Mm -hmm. And it was a nice way just to sort of, you know, build some familiarity, build some connections, understand sort of who was working in the different countries that you had, you know, that were part of your teams. And it was just a very quick win for us that, you know, um, um, just brought a little bit of a spark of joy in people's days. Yeah, I'm, I have to say I'm very much enjoying our um, trivia. Every every two weeks, get together as a team for a bit of trivia, and it's uh, it's it's great fun. I've got to know people I I would never have normally sort of even bumped into in the office. So it's fantastic that kind of thing that, that's really come out of this. So there are some silver linings. Rupert, can I add to that as well? Um, I was running a program the other day, a leadership program the other day, and. Uh, um, at the end of the program, I just asked the question, would you guys like to go into breakout rooms and spend a bit of time together? So it was unscheduled. It was pretty much um, a spontaneous thing. And the group kept going for about an hour afterwards in different breakout rooms. And I just acted as a bit of a speed dating person. I just moved them from room to room. 
Um, and the feedback was phenomenal. People said it's just really nice to be able to connect and have that informal uh, discussion. So I think, you know, take the opportunity if you are running a program to think about, do you want to take a bit of time on for, for as Darren said, some of that human hour, because it's really important. Yeah. And, and particularly think, for the leaders, yeah. I think to add to that as well as Cathy, I think one of the things we were with part with Mercer was, you know, um, during this time, we actually, you know, rolled out HBDI questionnaires to all of our employees. Yeah. It was such a fantastic thing we did because it actually got people understanding what their preferences were, yeah. you know, and understand where, you know, how people operate under pressure. And it almost built this corporate empathy that people have now. Yeah. And from that, you know, as part of like the adult learning model, STEMI 2020, like this has been a good way to sort of drive the 20 of people learning off each other mm. because they understand understanding how they think and they're understanding sort of what you know what ticks them off what what makes them happy um it's it's created a real sense of real it's a, a bit of love you know in well, it nice they're also um asking about each department so what's sale you know what's the profile of the sales department what's the profile of the the food services department so they're quite curious about it i think as well Absolutely. And it's got to the point where now we're getting emails from people saying, oh, this is my yellow speaking, yeah. this is my blue speaking. Right, yeah. Like, you know, is this, this is a nice story which like, like development is actually sticking like, yeah. long after after a session, but it's also driving a better sense of warm and fuzziness within, within the teams. Mm. Great. Um, so one of the questions that we have had in, in the Q&A box here, so it's, it's aimed at you, Darren, but we'll, we'll get opinions from everybody. So when you talk about identifying emerging leaders, how important is developing resilience in your new emerging leaders? Uh, extremely important. I think, you know, as a, as a, you know, as a new leader, you will, you will fail a lot of times. I think I, I raised my hand when I first stepped into a people leader role, I made every cardinal mistake you probably could make. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, like the, re, 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 the reason it made, made it easier was because I had a leader that, you know, allowed me to sort of, you know, fail fast, fail quickly, but fail safely. Um, so it's, it, it not only does it, it rely on the individual themselves, but it's also a big part of the leader's leader to make, give that, that space and environment to, you know, mm -hmm. to try new things. Because, yeah, people are complex, you know, um, especially during this current time. So it, it's, you know, not just resilience, but grit, you know, being able to sort of just stick it tough during during this time. Like it's, you know, um, we've all had long days. I think, you know, the days are definitely getting longer um, working working from home. But it's it also comes back to that leader's leader as well, because you often find as a new leader, you will mirror what your manager does. And um, so, and I guess the summary of that is saying that you've got to pick your leaders right, make the investment, don't rush into picking leaders, you know, Put your leaders through the test so that you know because it's the, the probably one of the most important you know recruiting decisions you'll ever make. Kim, what would you say? I'd say extremely important, but for me, it's probably more around uh, resourcefulness rather than resilience. Mm. So making sure that you have your go-to people, you know, when you're when you're maybe feeling not as resilient as usual, uh, know where you need to get support from. Angela, anything? Yeah, look, I definitely agree with 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 Kim and Darren's um, comments. I think I think resilience and resourcefulness can sometimes be overlooked. You know, we look to the core competencies that we that we traditionally have in leaders, and sometimes overlook some of that those nuances around resourcefulness and 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 resilience. But it is critically important. Great. Okay. I think another question that I've had for everybody that, that sort of comes as we're talking here is, is around sort of engagement. Um, so we talked about how sort of we develop the right culture, how we develop and encourage employees to sort of, you know, lean in and, and, and take advantage of things. Um, and obviously at the moment with everybody working from home and more spread out, we've worked out how we can stay connected. But in terms of the impact on engagement, where does, where does upskilling and reskilling and, and preparing people for the future of work fit? Kim, I'll start with you if you don't mind. Well, that's a challenging one. Um, I might throw over to Kathy first. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay, and I'll reference something that Darren's organisation's doing in my answer, if you like. Um, <laughs> so one of the things we did with the HBDI is um, uh, Kraft Heinz made the decision that not only would they have the virtual sessions, but they'd send a tangible pack of 
um, supporting materials to each person's home. So um, they had their virtual session and then they received their pack and it was terrific because it, you know, um, when they came to their second session when we were doing more on the application, they were able to say, look, I've got it. I've been looking at it. I've been using it. And um, I think that there was a lot of mileage, if you like, out of um, that thought that the organisation had to say, we really want to support you in applying it. Um, and they could have said, look, we'll wait until we're all back in the class, you know, in, in the office. Um, but that's not what the decision that Craft Heinz made. So I think um, it's little things like that that make a difference as well. The, you know, the Friday afternoon drinks, the staying on with Zoom. And I think to the previous question you asked, actually, Rupert, um, I, I actually don't think it's just the emerging leaders that uh, need that support around resilience and resourcefulness. I actually think it's some of the senior leaders because there's been a lot on their shoulders and they have had to really um, be that rock for their organisations. And certainly um, the example I gave where people stayed on in the breakout rooms, that was really about decompressing. Um, so I actually think that's something that's needed right throughout every level of leadership in the organisation. Yeah, something I wouldn't mind picking up on um, what Darren said earlier. Darren talked about the pressure that's on people. And one thing I have found with people in my team, I look after the business partnering team. Uh, they've had a, you know, a lot of work to do and a lot of support that they provide to people. And at times it's been extremely busy. I'm sure people have felt that um, in their own roles and they tend to speed up. And what I've said to them is, you know, when, when you're feeling very busy or overwhelmed, you need to actually slow down. Yeah. So stop pause, take a breath, um, have a think about what, what you need to do, talk to other people, reach out, and then come up with a solution before you respond. I think one of the things that we that we found, especially, you know, with Craft Hines being a global company, like when, when we're waking up in Australia, the US is, you know, they're logging off. And then when we're logging off, the UK are waking up in the morning. So it's sort of, it's very easy for us to be working 12 to 18 hours a day and often have these meetings late at night. So one of the things we've sort of been doing is telling people, you know, is this a meeting you need to have? If not, decline it. You know, can it just be over an email? Make it over an email. And our AMD has been very big on, Friday afternoons and no meetings. If you want to go learn guitar, go learn guitar. You know, if you want to do a learning course, go do it. If you want to go for a walk, go do it. You need to turn off your camera, do that too. Like it is, it is exhausting being in front of a camera all the time. So mm -hmm. we, we've tried to put more onus back on our, on our employees to take ownership of their work days and make sure they've got their well-being at heart as well. Because it's it's easy to stay at your computer and and just and just work constantly, especially when you've got emails coming from you know early in the morning from the US and late at night from from Amsterdam. So how then do we leave the space for people to actually? take time to out to reskill and upskill and get to know all the new things that we're asking them to do. Yeah. Look, for, for us as a company, what we've done is we've got, um, we've implemented learning hours. So once a month, you know, everyone serves tools down and they go and do a learning course, whether it's on an LMS or it's, you know, something they want to read an article about or go learn the guitar. It's one hour that everyone's tools down, no one does any work and they just focus on learning. Um, and the uptake of it's been, it's been a bit of hit and miss because some people just want to, you know, let's work through constantly, but uh, we are getting our, you know, our letters to go, nope, this is learning time, but you can push that email out or that, you know, that deadline out later on. We've really encouraged flexible working arrangements. So mm -hmm. take the time out you need when you need it, as long as you're available, should we need you, but um, really focus on yourself and your own wellbeing. I think um, certainly those things for Darren and Kim, it's about um, giving people permission to do those things. I think, you know, we take for granted that people know that they can, you know, take time out for learning or take time out for themselves, but it's actually culturally giving that, um, that permission. I think it's also, and I facilitate a lot virtually, obviously, but um, I start every session by saying, you know what, if your dog barks, your child comes in, you get a knock at the door, it's okay. That's just part of our reality. And it, it just makes people feel comfortable because um, there's sort of that need to be on all the time. And actually you're in your home and you're continuing under really unusual circumstances. And it's okay. If you need to switch your camera off because your child needs you, that's okay. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's just making it real. True. We often talk, Kathy, about juggling. And I think we've had this conversation before that yeah. every day we juggle so many things. And really the secret is about knowing uh, which balls are glass and which balls are rubber. You know, if you drop the glass ones, you're going to be in big trouble. But if you if you drop the rubber ones, they'll bounce. So the minute that you can work that out, I, I think it sets you up pretty well. That's a great analogy. Thank you. So I think... Um, 
there's uh, no more questions I can see in the Q and A. Um, so we might start wrapping things up. So I think in doing that, there'll be um, we'll be sharing some of our uh, details and slides and so on uh, um, after this. But from each panelist, it'd be really great to hear what your sort of one key sort of takeaway from what we've just discussed has been. So Kathy, I'll start with you. If you don't mind. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the single key takeaway is make sure your leaders are looked after, your leaders are focusing on learning and development because it starts with them. Um, the example they set, the um, engagement they have with their employees, the role modelling they do around their own learning and development makes such a difference in an organisation. Aaron? Yeah, look, for me, the way I've said it is spend the time to recalibrate your leaders, recalibrate your core skills before you make your big bets into your new skills. Because I guess without those two, like, you know, these big reskilling investments will fail. Mm. Mm. Um, learning comes in many different ways. It comes through formal courses. It comes through, you know, talking to your peers. It comes through um, webinars. Find, find what's right for you. Angela? Oh, it's certainly for me, it's that importance of upskilling. Um, you know, allow managers to really focus on that coaching and development role that they have, that they you know, might not think about every minute of every day, but it, it probably has one of the biggest um, impacts on, on their outcomes for their part of their business unit and, and certainly from a, a future planning and succession piece as well. Incredibly important. So to sum up, essentially, it starts with leadership. Um, people need to make time, have an environment where they feel like they can get on with doing what they want to do, look after themselves and their, their learning and their, their future. Great. Um, so as we said, um, Harris, I think you can share your slide, but we're sharing um, a number of links to um, our refreshed website um, and also some of the details of the global talent trends as well. Um, but please do reach out to um, any of us um, and reach out to us, find us on LinkedIn and so on, um, or reach out to us via the website if you want to talk about any of the stuff that we've discussed today. Um, that seems to me to thank our panel.